Hello, my name's Alan Fitch. I'm from Ericsson Television Limited, and this is a little talk on continuation, sorry, continuous integration for FPGA design and verification. Um, as you can see, the title didn't quite fit in in the big font across the top, but it's along the bottom. So this talk was given at the Verification Futures Conference in Reading on the 5th of February. So here's a little agenda. I'm going to give you a little introduction to Ericsson Television and what we do. The Ericsson TV FPGA group within Ericsson, we're known as the Firmware Group, which might be a bit confusing, but we're actually doing FPGAs. Um, so if I accidentally say firmware, imagine that I'm saying FPGA. The design flow we currently have, any issues we might currently have, why we're interested in continuous in integration, um, how we used it for building, for simulation, and then a few little conclusions at the end. Um, I'm obviously recording this later after the talk, and I'll try and remember any questions that came up at the end as well, just to add them in. So, what is Ericsson Television? We're part of Ericsson. We're a market leader in professional video processing solutions for compression. So that's broadcast video equipment. Um, our main site is at Hedge End near Southampton in the UK. There's somewhere around 200 engineering staff. We also have an ASIC activity in High Wycombe, so if you include them, it's probably closer to 280. And then within that 200 engineering staff, there's loads and loads of software engineers, um, but there's also a little firmware group, or FPGA design and development group, which has about 30 staff. Um, we're developing FPGAs in different technologies, and the largest project is probably five, one million logic equivalent, logic element gates, which I guess you could call, if you said 10 NAND gates was a logic element, it's like a 10 million gate IC, so that's 50 million gates or something. Anyway, they're big. It's the executive summary, they're big chips, and so we need to think about verification. And then there's also a set of existing designs in maintenance mode, which still have to be looked after. And I'll come back to that later on during the talk. We have a design flow, and the design flow uses VHDL designs, so we're primarily designing in VHDL. We have tickle, compile, and build scripts, and um, that's a flow that's been built up over the years, so we're kind of still using it. Uh, everyone always says, why don't you use make, or why don't you use whatever, but we've got this tickle script flow, and it works. We have a lot of designs with VHDL test benches, and then we're using subversion for revision control. On the larger projects, we've put considerably more effort into verification because, of course, as the chips get bigger and bigger, it's much harder just to plug them into the design or use chip scope or signal tap or whatever to figure out what's going on. So we're actually using UVM system Verilog based test environments, so that's the universal verification methodology, which is a system Verilog class library. And we're using a set of standardized base classes that we've developed ourselves to help with reuse. Um, within the 30 FPGA engineers, there's a mixture of roles, and we do have some specialized verification engineers in that group. So what kind of issues did we have? Um, for FPGA builds, we wanted to make it sort of push button so people could build an FPGA and schedule builds to happen over the weekend. For FPGA simulation, we wanted to set up lots of regressions, especially with the bigger chip with UV chips with UVM SV. Um, ideally in a non-proprietary way, so people often say, can't you use mentor verification run manager or whatever, but we decided to do it in a non-proprietary way. We wanted to eventually extend the regressions to VHDL. Um, one of the reasons for that is because of the legacy projects. Um, we often had the experience where existing sims would stop working for whatever reason, so some slight script change or an environment change, even if all the subversion code was locked for some reason, it would suddenly stop working, so it rotted away. So we wanted the ability to keep those sims going by regression. And then, of course, it does give you efficient use of licenses. You can use licenses at times when there's no one in the office. So how did we approach that? Um, we could have done things to our existing tickle flow if we thought about it and made a lot of effort. But in fact, we already had software groups on the same site at Southampton 
who were using the Jenkins continuous integration server. Um, there is a web link to Jenkins on the last slide in the presentation, but it's an open source project written in Java and it's cross-platform and it's designed for running continuous integration and regression type um, problems or solutions, I suppose I should say. It's a solution, not a problem. Um, the software groups had already implemented that. So what we had to do was extend it to go to FPGA build and simulation. And that work was carried out by people during our so-called innovation days, which are bits of time allocated during sprints. So we're using agile development methodology. So we have a little bit of time allocated during sprints to process improvements, so working out better ways to do things. As well as for builds, we also wanted that for UVM regressions and then to extend it to VHGL test benches. So application to build, as I said, we had a tickle flow. We have a tickle flow which works out, works very well, but it still requires the user to know exactly what directory to use and which script options to supply. And of course, the user might have to check out a subversion database and if they're moving on to a different project, those can be quite large databases and it can all be a bit tedious having to check something out just to build it when you could just press a button. So the idea of the Jenkins continuation, continuous integration server is that it allows arbitrary commands to be run on a Jenkins slave node. So we've ended up with a system where we have a Jenkins master, if you like, that talks to a set of slaves and we have one of those slaves in the firmware department, so that's a Jenkins slave. That Jenkins slave is itself a grid engine master, so it's running jobs using the scheduling grid engine software onto a Linux farm. So we've got a number of machines on the farm, they have jobs launched by a grid engine, and then the Jenkins server talks to that grid engine master, which is treated as a Jenkins slave. So hopefully that makes sense. We've got a grid Jenkins master talking to a Jenkins slave, the Jenkins slave is itself a grid engine master, which then launches jobs on the Linux servers, the, fl the farm servers. So the people who did the work had a go at using Jenkins, and it all works. And so on here, I've got a little snapshot of uh, what you see. So at the top is a picture of what you see in Jenkins. So you see a little green um, status, which can be red, green, or yellow, depending on whether it's bad, good, or in the middle. There's then a little weather symbol, and that shows you a sort of trend over time. So if it's been green for a long time, you get a nice sun. If it's been green and it's failed on the previous run, you get clouds with lightning. If it failed a few runs ago, you get clouds without lightning. So it gives you a quick view. Over on the right, you get a summary of the number of builds. You then get a sort of go button, which is the button you press to make something run. And then it just executes shell commands. It will run on Windows, but as we're using Linux clients ultimately, um, we've got bash shell scripts here. So you see it's just picking out a directory and running the, the job run is our little tickle script and that does all the hard work. So someone else does that, they set that up, and then someone else who wants to use it just comes along, presses the green button, and it works. At the end, you can output things and add so-called post-build actions, including emailing people, so you can get the Jenkins system to email people when things go wrong. Um, up here, where it says cron trigger, that allows you to put in how often you want things to run. It uses the rather cryptic cron syntax out of Unix, but luckily, as you're typing things in, it gives you a little dialog telling you what you've actually done. So on here, it's telling it to run. Someone's put a comment in, luckily, so it's saying run at 7 o'clock on Sunday. So that's day 0, hour 19, and then the 7 at the end. I can't remember what that means. Uh, no, that must be 7 o'clock, mustn't it? No, that must be something else. Anyway, it's a complicated syntax. You can look it up in Mancron if you've got a Linux machine in front of you. So that worked very well. Um, once it was set up, people could literally come along, press a button, and it would do everything. And then you can set the jobs up either to do a subversion checkout as part of the job, or on some of our other scripts, we set it up so that we did one subversion checkout and then did multiple regressions based on that checkout. So that's an example of the build. Um, if you look at simulation, um, one of the things that we do in simulation is we want to be able to pick up the results. And the way Jenkins works is you can tell it to scan for a little XML file. 
that XML file is written out in a format that comes from the JUnit, unit test framework that was originally developed with Java. And that XML is a little orange box down the bottom of the slide that shows you what it looks like. It's very simple. You just have to write out test suite, test case, and then name of test, class name, and then time. So that's the time in seconds, I think, from memory. Um, so that's very easy to write out. In our initial approach, what we did on the project where we were using UVM is in the report phase of the scoreboard, we wrote out a little JUnit file. So this, where it says JUnit results equals new, that's creating a little JUnit class with the file name. And then down here it says add test. It adds in the test value and whether it's passed or failed with a little macro. Um, and that works nicely. Uh, what you end up with once you run your simulations is you tell Jenkins to scan all the XML files and then you get these nice red and green dots. So this is an example of a typical simulation we were running for regression, so not a build, a simulation. So you'll see there's a job for checkout, a job called overnight regression, um, which is the one that actually runs. That overnight regression job is actually what's known in Jenkins as a build flow. In Jenkins, there's a million, well, I'm exaggerating, there's a lot of plugins available, and one of them is this build flow plugin, and it has a little scripting language. So what we're doing is doing a checkout first, and then running a set of jobs in parallel. This particular example, to make it fit on the slide, um, I just chosen it on, we had one job, but you can run multiple regressions in series or parallel. So the main job, this overnight regression, was triggered to go off at midnight, and then it ran the sub job, in this one, this one called CSM Interfaces Regression, and that would run a set of tests, write out the XML files, and out would pop the result. Um, unfortunately, I've copied a one a screenshot when it was failing there, but honestly, it is normally green and passing. We did add another little feature, which is we're using at Southampton the Quest uh, toolset, um, and like other tools, that writes out a coverage database. So this little thing called Project Crawler runs once an hour, scans through a set of project locations, looking at all the UCDB files, the coverage database files from Questa, and then builds a little prep page that shows you the status um, as a web page. So you can then just go and look at the web page and see whether functional coverage, assertion coverage, um, code coverage, and so on, what they look like for all the projects. And then down here, here's an example of the post-build action with an email notification. And the default is it sends you when the build becomes unstable. So it emails you, or emails this list of names when the build becomes unstable. So the way we've organized this in the build flow, plugin is all, plugin is all Jenkins. Um, that project crawler thing was an extra script we wrote to write out a, an HTML page showing the status of coverage. So... That all works nicely. We did have a couple of issues. One of them was that the Jenkins master launches or connects to the Jenkins slave, i.e. our grid engine master, through SSH. And we've had problems with loss of SSH connection. So we've now added a little slave monitor plugin, which we found. Um, and one of my colleagues has added that. So that should hopefully recognize when the slave has got lost and reconnect it. The other thing was in our example on the previous slides, I showed writing out the XML from the report phase of the scoreboard of a UVM test bench. Of course, that's then tied to UVM. So it's better to really write out the status from any wrapper script. So in our tickle script flow, we've now changed that. So it writes out the XML file from that script. So once it's finished, it scans the log, finds any words that mean error or failure or whatever and then writes out the XML from there. And the good thing is that is, about that is then applies to all languages. It doesn't matter whether your test bench is System Verilog or UVM or VHDL. As long as you write the magic word error into the log file, it'll get picked up, and you'll get a little red dot in Jenkins. So in conclusion, um, Jenkins is a very powerful way to do regression and build. Although it was designed by or for software development originally, it's perfectly possible to apply it to FPGA build and FPGA simulation. Um, there's the website I mentioned at the beginning, jenkinsci.org, if you're interested. Um, a sort of side effect of doing this is that on larger projects, the email notification and the red-green amber status actually helps you keep on top of shared code. So we, for instance, had a shared 
um, package on our largest project and if someone went in and changed something in that package and forgot to tell you, you'd then find your job file and suddenly realise that something had changed, go and talk to them, realise what it was, fix it and so on. So it kind of helped promote communication within the project in a reasonably large department. Um, it lets you have a push button or time triggered builds and sims. Because we were lucky and had a software group who were already using Jenkins, we've got a common platform now across software and firmware or FPGA. Um, current plans to extend it across the existing legacy VHDL sims to run smoke tests, in other words, to check that the basic simulations compile and run. So even if they don't write out the correct um, pass error fail or whatever, even if they don't write the message that log scanner understands, it will at least check that they compile. And that has been a problem where people check test benches in and then they don't get touched for a year and suddenly when you want to fix a bug or a defect that's come in you can't run them again. So we're going to extend that out. And then also Jenkins has some built-in features or sorry it has a plugin rather that does so-called build radiator which is a very Jenkinsy bit of jargon for basically something that shows you the status of all the jobs on the continuations, continuous integration server. Um, and we're going to get one of those up and running, so that'll give us sort of, it'll be good. First, it'll show people what the status is, but also it'll help promote it throughout the whole department, so it's not just the UVM people who are um, seeing what's happening with regression, it'll help promote it out across the whole department. So that's the end of the talk. Um, at the actual presentation at the conference on the 5th of February, a couple of people asked some questions. One I remember was, um, is it easy to persuade people to go to this level of writing tests that are self-checking and can be put into regression? Um, and the answer is not necessarily easy, but people can see the benefits. So uh, the VHDL engineers, the people who are using pure VHDL, do write self-checking test benches. So now that all they've got to do is basically add an option onto the tickle script and write out XML, um, it makes it much easier for them to put self-checking test benches into the Jenkins system and then they'll get the benefits of regression and status and so on and the smoke testing, making sure that everything still builds. Um, the other question I seem to remember, someone asked whether, well they, they'd been applying it to build but they hadn't realised it could apply to simulation and because it just runs scripts, um, bash scripts basically in our case on Linux, you can apply equally well to build auto simulation so it works fine. Um, so that's the end of the talk. Thank you.